In the last session, we discussed regarding the Hilful Fudul, the pact of the virtuous, what, how it occurred, what it entailed, and the different lessons that we can derive and learn from the pact of the virtuous that was in the previous uh, session. Today, inshallah, we will be discussing regarding the second journey to Sham and the marriage to Sayyidah Khadir al-Kubra radiallahu ta'ala anha. And there's only one more incident before the beginning of Revelation, which is the rebuilding of the Kaaba, that inshallah we will discuss next week. So we already know that the Prophet ﷺ has been to Sham once. He went with his uncle Abu Talib and that is where the incident with Bahira took place which we have covered already. Now we've already mentioned as well why the uh, Quraysh and the people of Mecca used to travel to Sham and to Yemen. Those were the trading journeys that they used to go on. They were people of trade, they were involved in commerce and they were merchants. At the time this incident takes place, the Prophet ﷺ is approximately 25 years old. And in Mecca al Mukarramah and amongst the Quraysh, the Prophet ﷺ has become well known as being very trustworthy and being a very honorable individual. As we know from the previous incidents we've mentioned and also how Abu Talib used to treat the Prophet ﷺ and how other Quraysh dealt with the Messenger ﷺ that they asked him to be a part of the Hilful Fudul as well. So they obviously knew that he was an honorable and trustworthy individual and other incidents also uh, indicate that the Meccans and the Qurayshi had immense uh, respect for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and this became well known amongst their people. At the same time, there was a woman known as Khadija, Khadija bint Khuwailid. Who is Sayyidah Khadija radiallahu anha? So this is obviously before her marriage to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She is not just a normal lay person. Rather, she is a noble woman. She is of great lineage and she is also very wealthy. Okay, why? Because she is a merchant. She is involved in commerce and trade just like the other people of Quraysh and the other people of Mecca are involved in commerce and trade. What does she do? She does what the other Qurayshis do as well. She buys goods from uh, Syria, sells them in Mecca and even sends them down to Yemen and sells them there. Then she buys uh, goods from Yemen, brings them up to Mecca, sells uh, some in Mecca and then sends them back up to Syria and send them there. So that, that as we know, these were the two uh, trading journeys that Hashim inaugurated in the early life of the Quraysh. So Sayyidah Khadija is already uh, involved in this trading. Now, because she cannot travel herself as she's a woman, what would she do? She would hire people uh, and employ people to take her goods on their behalf, on her behalf and sell them wherever she needed them going. So she would uh, employ someone, send them to uh, Sham to sell her goods and bring back the profits. And then th she would send people to uh, Yemen, sell the goods there and bring the profits back to her in Makkah al -Mukarama. But she had done this multiple times and every time she hired somebody, they would betray her. They would betray her, meaning they would lie to her, they would cheat to her, they would deceive her, and she would never ever receive the entire profits of her merchandise and her goods that had been sold in those different locations. So what did Khadija bin Khawali do this time? What did she do? She wanted to hire someone who was honorable. She wanted to hire someone who was trustworthy. She wanted to hire someone who was going to do good trade and bring her back full profits. And she'd heard about the honesty and the trustworthiness of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam already, as all of the Quraysh knew, Khadija bint Khuwailid already knew about his honesty and his trustworthiness. So what did she do? She extended that invitation to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with regards to taking her goods to Sham and selling them. Now, the Prophet Sallallahu agreed and he decided to take the goods from Mecca and travel up to Sham. However, there is a bit of a misconception here that some people say that Sayyidah Khadira radiallahu anha, she employed the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as though the Prophet sallallahu is a worker for her, like an employee. However, that's not the case. Why? Because Ibn Ishaq himself mentions explicitly and other historians also mention that at that time, the way they used, the caravans used to work, that if the owner of the caravan is not traveling themselves and they are employing someone or sending someone else on their behalf, they would... Uh, perform a transaction which is known as a mudaraba. Okay, and a mudaraba in simple English is a profit sharing transaction. Now, what does this mean? A simple understanding of mudaraba is that mudaraba involves two parties. So, there is someone who is known as Rabbul Mal, meaning the investor, 
and there is someone known as the mudarib, meaning the investment manager. So if you can understand from the example, the Qurayshis have goods that they need selling. Okay, so what they would do is they would be the Rabbul Mal. The goods and the merchandise would be owned by them. They would be the investor. They are investing their goods. The person going and taking them would be the mudarib, the investment manager. He is managing the investment. How is he managing the investment? He is taking it from Mecca. He is taking it up to Sham or he is taking it down to Yemen. And he is selling there and getting the profits and then bringing them back. So he is responsible for the investment itself in taking it and making use of it and bringing back profits and earning profits from it. So that is what a mudaraba contract is. And it's common in our times as well, especially in uh, Sharia compliant mortgages. They use this mudaraba. I'm not saying that they're permissible. I'm just explaining that this is what they uh, use as a formula of getting away and out of interest, a mudaraba contract. So it's a profit sharing contract. So it is incorrect to say that the Prophet ﷺ was like a worker and an employee for Sayyidah Khalid al-Kubra. Rather, they were in a transaction together and they were both partners in that sense because it was on a profit-sharing basis. Meaning that if you take this merchandise for me from Mecca and you travel to Sham and you sell it, whatever profit you make from that, then we will split it. And those terms are agreed. For example, it is said, if you were to travel, like for example, Hussein is here. Hussein, if he was to travel on my behalf and go to Sham and sell some goods and he would come back with a thousand pound profit, that profit would then be uh, split 70-30. So I would keep 700 pound and he would get 300 pound in return. So technically he's not an employee, rather we are partners in a mudaraba contract. So that is how they would uh, function with regard to the caravans when they were taking them to different locations. So Sayyidah Khadira radiallahu anha entered into an investment and a profit sharing contract with the Prophet wasalam, And we don't know the men, uh, the exact ratio is not mentioned as to how much was agreed, but we know that it was a mudaraba contract through the explicit wording of Ibn Ishaq. So the Prophet wasalam, and Khadira, they agree and they finalize the terms and they agree on the ratio, etc. And the Prophet ﷺ sets off to Sham for his second trading journey. Okay, So the Prophet ﷺ's first journey to Sham was with Abu Talib, and the second journey was uh, with a profit-sharing contract with Sayyidah Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. Alongside the Prophet ﷺ, Sayyidah Khadija sends who? She sends her servant who is called Maysara. Maysara was a servant of Sayyidah Khadija, and the Prophet ﷺ uh, took him as well to Sham when they went on this journey. And we mentioned previously as well that the Arabs and the Qurayshis, especially when they would be going to Mecca, they would travel to a specific location known as Busra. Okay, and that's not the Busra that is in uh, Iraq at the moment, and it is not the um, Bursa that's in Turkey. This is a different place known as Bostra in English as well. And the ruins of that city are still present today. Why did they used to go there? They used to travel to that particular location because that was the marketplace. It was like the trading hub. People from all around that region used to come to Bostra to trade and sell and buy goods. So the Prophet ﷺ is on his way there with Maysara, the servant. And before they reach the city of Bostra, or just on the outskirts of the city, it is said that the Prophet ﷺ alongside Maysara, they rest beneath a tree. They rest beneath a tree and near the tree there is a monastery. And in that monastery there is a monk named Nastura. Okay, And we'll get to the monk and his story in a, sh- uh, in a second. Here we have that the Prophet ﷺ explicitly mentions that the Prophet ﷺ and Maysara took shade beneath a tree. And it is said that the tree that is present in Jordan right now, uh, known as Ash-Shajaratul Mubaraka, the blessed tree, it is said that that tree is the very tree that the Prophet ﷺ took shade under whilst he was traveling with his servant Maysara on this journey. And you can see that that tree is uh, it's huge, it's massive, and it looks very old as well. And there is no other tree in that entire area except that one tree. So these are some of the signs that the scholars have mentioned as to the legitimacy, uh, the legitimacy of that tree being the very tree that the Prophet ﷺ took shade under. So that's done. Then the Prophet ﷺ is resting beneath this tree and the monastery is nearby. The monk in that monastery is Nastura. So there's two monks. The monk in the first journey was Bahira and the monk in the second journey to Sham is known as Nastura. 
Nastur at this time, he comes out of his monastery and he speaks with Maysara. He speaks with the servant and he says to the servant, Oh Maysara, who is this man that is resting beneath this tree? And Maysara informed him and replied, Oh Nastura, this is a man from Quraysh and the Quraysh are the people who hold the sanctuary. Meaning he's introducing the Prophet ﷺ by saying that he is a noble man. He belongs to the Quraysh and the Quraysh are noble. Why? Because they are the custodians of the sacred house in Makkah al Upon hearing this, Nastura replied and said to Maysara, مَا نَزَلَ تَحْتَ هَذِهِ الشَّجَرَةِ قَدْتُ إِلَّا نَبِيٌّ Okay, these are the exact words that are quoted by Ibn Ishaq in his seerah. مَا نَزَلَ تَحْتَ هَذِهِ الشَّجَرَةِ قَدْتُ إِلَّا نَبِيٌّ Which translate as what? They translate as none but a prophet ever sat beneath this tree. So just by looking at the Prophet ﷺ and seeing him resting beneath that tree, Nastura realized the greatness and the prophethood of the Prophet ﷺ. And we know that a previous incident has occurred where Bahira recognized the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and here Nastura, a different mock, is recognizing the Prophet alayhi salatu wasallam. Now, a question may arise. Someone may object, object that how does Nastura, a monk living in a monastery, know that there can uh, that only a prophet has ever sat beneath a beneath this tree? How can he know that? Because the time between the Prophet ﷺ and Sayyidina Isa is around 500, 550 years. So how can Nastura, number one, be alive for that long to know that no Prophet has sat beneath this tree? And the Prophets are from Sayyidina Adam ﷺ all the way to Sayyidina Isa. There has been thousands of Prophets. So this claim cannot be substantiated. How can Nastura make this claim? That's an objection. Another person may say that how does Nastura know that it is that very tree. Like maybe he might have heard that there's a tree somewhere and beneath that tree there's only a prophet that has ever sat. How does Nasura know this is that tree? Number three, the objection could be that how can that tree survive for that, that long? That if no one but a prophet has sat beneath the, this tree, then this tree, how, how old is this tree? Is it, is it millions of years old? How do we know? So this is an objection posed by some orientalists and other people regarding the statement of مَا نَزَلَ تَحْتَ هَذِهِ الشَّجَرَةِ قَدْتُ إِلَّا نَبِيٌّ The simple answer is what? That when Nastura says مَا نَزَلَ تَحْتَ هَذِهِ الشَّجَرَةِ قَدْتُ إِلَّا نَبِيٌّ What he actually means is that in this very moment right now, there is a prophet sitting beneath this tree. That's what it means. And the wording, we know that in Arabic, there's rhetoric and there's emphasis and there's ta'kid in particular, uh, sentences that the Arab used to use and they sometimes exaggerate in terms of their speech. But what they're saying is still truthful. Their speech is sometimes exaggerated. And this is an example of that exaggeration, that mubalagha that Nastura has done. What he actually means that beneath this tree right now is a prophet or is none but a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's a simple answer to that objection. So Nastura understands the greatness of the Prophet wasalam, and he sees that the signs of prophethood within the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and that is why he makes this claim regarding the prophet that not no one or none but a prophet is sitting beneath this tree at this moment in time. Upon hearing this, obviously, Maysara would have understood also the greatness of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Moving on, Ibn Ishaq then mentions that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi and Maysara went to Basra and they did their dealing. They sold what they needed to sell and they bought what they needed to buy. And some of the uh, scholars of Sira also mention an incident that occurred here where whilst the Prophet ﷺ was trading with a person in Bostra with regards to the goods and the merchandise that he already had, when he was trading and buying and selling those things, one of the merchants asked him to swear by Allah and al uzza uh, And the Prophet ﷺ denied it completely. And he said, Wallahi, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I will not take an oath by these two false idols and gods. And that is when this man went and started saying to Maysara and other people that this person is a prophet or this person is a chosen individual. And this incident also occurs at this time. But Ibn Ishaq does not mention that and he carries on. And he mentions that the Prophet ﷺ did his dealings in um, Bostra and they began returning to Makkah al-Mukarramah. Then he mentions another incident. So another miracle of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that Maysara saw. What did he see? Maysara sees that whilst they were returning to Makkah al-Mukarramah on their return journey at the height of noon and with intense heat. So it's bang on, the sun is on its zenith 
and there's intense heat. As you could imagine, they're traveling in the desert land. Okay, they're traveling in open sky and the sun is at its peak, meaning it's very, very, very hot. Okay, and he sees that the beast that the Prophet ﷺ is traveling upon is being shaded. And the Prophet ﷺ is being shaded by angels. And he sees this miracle, subhanAllah. He sees this miracle of the Prophet ﷺ that angels are coming to provide shade for the Prophet ﷺ whilst he is traveling upon his animal and upon his ride. So we already know from other incidents that the Prophet ﷺ was being shaded by the tree. The Prophet ﷺ was being shaded by the cloud. And here the Prophet ﷺ is being shaded by angels giving him shade due to the intensity of the heat. So Maysalah sees this and he remembers and he uh, makes a note of this incident as well. So he's made a note of the incident that occurred with Nastura. He's made a note of the incident that occurred whilst they were buying and selling. And he's also made a note of this incident that there were two angels that were providing shade for the Prophet ﷺ. They returned back to Makkah al-Mukarramah. Some of the uh, scholars of Sirah mentioned that upon their return to Makkah al-Mukarramah, where Sayyida Khadija was waiting for the return of their caravan and from her balcony, she herself saw that the Prophet ﷺ was being shaded by two angels. However, however, Ibn Ishaq does not mention that. He mentions that Maysalah had seen this. So they return back to Makkah al-Mukarramah. They've done their dealings in Sham. They come and the Prophets are given to uh, Sayyida Khadija radiallahu anha. And here, what Sayyida Khadija noted, notices, she notices that the Prophets that she has been given are immense. Meaning this is nearly double what she would normally receive from her prophets in Sham when she would send somebody else. And this was for two reasons. Number one, because of the honesty and the trustworthiness of the Prophet ﷺ. When he takes the goods of Sayyida Khadija and her mer- merchandise to, uh, to Sham to sell, there was no cheating, there was no deceiving. Everything was bound by a trust because the Prophet ﷺ is Al-Ameen. He is trustworthy. Number two, because any dealing that is done by the hands of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself will have immense barakah in it itself. Okay, These are the reasons as to why the Prophets that were given back to Khadija Al-Kubra was nearly double. Ibn Ishaq mentions double or more in normal Prophet that, he would, uh, that she would have received from other people. And this incident showed the honesty and the barakah in the trade of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to Sayyidah Khadija Al-Kubra. Alongside this, when Maysala then meets Khadija al-Kubra, the servant, and he informs her regarding the incidents that have occurred. Number one, he's seen that the Prophet ﷺ is a very honest trader. He has seen that there is barakah in the trading of the Prophet ﷺ. He's seen the incident that occurred during the transactions, uh, transaction were taking place. He recalls the incident of Nastura. He recalls the incident of the uh, angels shading the Prophet ﷺ. And he mentions all of these incidents to Sayyidah Khadija. And imagine this, Maysala is coming back. He's, he's, he's physically seen all of these things happening and now he sits in front of uh, Khadija bin the Khuwailid and he explains all of these miraculous things that he has seen whilst he's on this journey with uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Of course, Sayyidah Khadija, upon hearing all of this, her respect and her honor that she had for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam increased. So that is the incident of the second journey to Sham. A quick recap. Sayyidah Khadija uh, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam enter into a profit sharing partnership known as a mudaraba. Sayyidah Khadija has some merchandise and goods in Mecca and the Prophet is going to take them to Sham, to Syria and sell them and bring back some profits and the profits will then be split. On his journey, they pass by, they meet a monk named Nastura, whilst the Prophet is shading beneath the tree. And he says, مَا نَزَلَ تَحْتَ هَذِهِ الشَّجَرَةِ قَدْتُ إِلَّا نَبِي That only a Prophet is sitting beneath this tree at this moment in time, showing the greatness of the Messenger. Then they go on further to Bostra. They do their dealings and the incident take play, takes place about where the Prophet ﷺ does not take an oath by Lat and Uzza. And they see that and then they return from there. And then Maysara sees that two angels are shading the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam whilst he's returning and they come back and the profits that uh, were accumulated from this caravan journey, this trade journey were nearly double or more than what Khadija bin Khuwailid would normally receive by sending other people. All of this incident had occurred and from it the summary and the conclusion is what? Sayyidah Khadija 
or Khadija bint Khuwail radiyallahu anha, her honor, respect and love for the Prophet wasalam, had already increased having hearing all of these good things about him sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Now, we move on to the marriage of the Prophet wasalam, with Sayyidah Khadija. How does that unfold? Of course, this was a uh, precursor to the marriage of the Prophet wasalam. The journey, meaning Sayyidah Khadija had experienced dealings with the Prophet wasalam, and she had seen his praiseworthy characteristics. She had heard about the miraculous events that had occurred. Of course, all of this uh, increased love in the heart of Khadija radiallahu anha for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So she began inquiring more. Meaning she, she, she became more curious about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is it, is it actually like this where he's, he is exactly how he, he shows himself amongst people or is it different? Okay. And she becomes somewhat curious about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So what does she do? She wants to know about the Prophet's daily life and his personal life. Of course, Outside in his public life, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is a sadiq al amin. He is the trustworthy one. He's the honest one, and he's known like that amongst the Quraysh. And nobody's denying that. Nobody is saying otherwise. But she wanted to know about the private life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, meaning his daily routine. What does he do in his personal and his private life? So, in order to get that information, what does Sayyidah Khadija do? She goes to a woman known as Sayyida Safiya bint Abdul Muttalib. Who is Sayyida Safiya? Sayyida Safiya is the daughter of Abdul Muttalib and she is the aunt of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay? Sayyida Safiya bint Abdul Muttalib. Don't be confused with the wife of the Prophet known as Sayyida Safiya. That's a, that's a different Sayyida Safiya and we will discuss her when we get to that. Here, Sayyida Khadija, the first wife of the Prophet, goes to Sayyida Safiya bint Abdul Muttalib, the aunt of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now the question may arise, why does Sayyida Khadija go to the aunt Sayyida Safiya? Because Sayyida Safiya bint Abdul Muttalib is married to who? She is married to a man known as Awam. Awam who? Awam ibn Khuwaylid. Awam the son of Khuwaylid. So Sayyida Khadija and Awam are brothers and sisters. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Sayyida Safiya are uh, aunt and nephew. So th- Obviously, we know that the Quraysh were very interlinked in terms of their lineages and through marriage and uh, through other reasons as well. That's how they were interlinked. So Sayyidah Safiya is the Prophet's aunt and she is also the wife of Awam, who is the brother of Sayyidah Khadija. And Awam, you probably heard of this name before. Awam is the father of Sayyidah Zubair ibn Awam. Sayyidah Zubair ibn Awam is a very famous Sahabi of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, And he is a son of who? He's a son of... Awam and Sayyidah Safiya. But Awam, the father, passed away whilst the children were still young. So Sayyidah Safiya radiallahu anha, she brought up the children of Awam herself and amongst them was Sayyidah Zubair ibn al-Awam. So he, she goes to uh, Sayyidah Safiya for two reasons. Number one, she's close to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because she is her, uh, his aunt and Khadija uh, radiallahu anha is already close with Sayyidah Safiya for another reason because she is her sister-in-law. She's married to her brother. So she goes to Sayyidah Safiya and she inquires about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's private life and his personal life. The details of which are not mentioned but of course Sayyidah Safiya uh, must have said good things regarding the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his private life was very similar to his public life. He was still trustworthy. He was still honest. He would always... Uh, keep to his word and we know from Abdul Muttalib uh, not Abdul Muttalib sorry we know from Abu Talib and his praise of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was of great moral character and he displayed that not only in public but also in private he would display that moral character after having this conversation with Sayyida Safiya Sayyida Khadija becomes somewhat content and she's like okay I'm done I've seen his private life uh, sorry I've seen his public life I've sent him on a, uh, he's been on, uh, on a, uh, in a transaction with me. I've had dealings with him. I've spoken to his aunt and all of it seems good. So now she's ready to send her proposal. She's ready to send a proposal to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa for marriage. And she chooses Nafisa bint Munya. Nafisa, the daughter of Munya, as the person who will be taking the proposal on behalf of Sayyidah Khadija. Now, Let's pause here and look at a couple of things. The first thing is Sayyida Khadija is a very noble woman, okay? And she's wealthy. She's of a noble lineage. And she is a woman that 
other people from amongst the Quraysh want to marry because of her lineage, her nobility, and she is known as a Tahira. Okay, she's known as the pure one. She's known for her chastity as well. So she has all the good traits in herself. And she inquires about the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and finds that the Prophet wasallam has all of those good traits within him sallallahu alaihi wasallam as well. But there's a lesson we can learn, especially for the people who are seeking marriage, man or woman. The principle, uh, the principle, uh, applies that what we should be searching for when we're looking for marriage is moral character and good and uh, praiseworthy attributes and characteristics. Like Sayyidah Khadija looked in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam knew about Sayyidah Khadija Tul Kubra Radiallahu Anha as well. That's one lesson. The second lesson we learned that it's always good to inquire about the person's private life by doing as we normally would do. We do a bio data check. Okay, meaning you drink around people, you drink around people who know the family in order to get more information about the actual uh, character of that individual because many a time we find that people are completely different in public and completely different in private two separate personalities two different people that's why it's good to inquire about people who are close to that person in their private life as well they would give you a better understanding of the uh, character and the morality and values and principles of that individual as Sayyidah Khadija did by going to Sayyidah Safiya bint, uh, bint Abdul Muttalib to seek more information about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So moving on, Sayyidah Khadija then sends this proposal via Nafisa bint Munya. And here we pause for a second and we mention what Ibn Ishaq records explicitly in his book of Sila. He mentions why Sayyidah Khadija radiallahu anha wanted to marry the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because if you think about it, everyone wants to marry Sayyidah Khadija, meaning everyone wants to get uh, get a share of her wealth and they know that she's noble, she's chaste, etc. They know all of these. She's a perfect candidate for marriage. People want to marry her because they'll get that. But Sayyidah Khadija chooses the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and nobody else. Why? She mentions that herself. Ibn Ishaq writes that Sayyidah Khadija has said that I choose you Meaning, this is the reason why Sayyidah Khadija is, wants to send a proposal to the Prophet. She says, I choose you because of your kinship with me, your nobility amongst your people, your trustworthiness amongst them, your excellent character and because of your truthfulness. So Sayyidah Khadija gives five reasons as to why she wants to marry the Prophet wasallam and why she is sending this proposal in the first place. And you can see all of the five reasons that she is meant Mentioning regarding the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, all of them allude to the greatness and the honor and the incredible nature and moral character of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That he is truthful, he is trustworthy, and he is noble amongst his people. Okay, so you understand from this statement that Sayyidah Khadija wants to marry the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam because of his nobility and his incredible and immense character. Now. This woman, Nafisa bin Timunya, she takes the proposal of Sayyidah Khadija to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then goes on to inform his uncles about this proposal that has come from Sayyidah Khadija. Now, imagine everybody knows in the society, in the community that there is a woman, Khadija bin Khuwailid, she's well known, Khadija bin Khuwailid, she's well known, she's noble, she's chaste, she's wealthy, she's a, bus- a businesswoman, she has... Uh, good wealth and she has good trade etc they know all of the good things about this woman and then a uh, proposal comes from her for your child or for someone that you know for your nephew nobody's going to say no in a similar manner when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam takes this proposal to his uncles his uncles of course agree to the proposal and nobody says no who is going to refuse a proposal when the woman is known as tahira the chaste one nobody is going to refuse that proposal then the matter goes further. How does the matter go further? Some narrations uh, mention that the matter goes further by the uncles of the Prophet ﷺ going and taking the matter forward with Sayyidah Khadija's father, okay, Khwailid. However, uh, when you look at the different reports regarding this, you understand that this is a weak and a unsound position. The more accurate and the more correct reports indicate that Khuwailid had already passed away before this incident took place. Okay. Instead, they go to the uncle 
of Sayyidah Khadija, who is Amr ibn uh, Amr bin Asad. Amr bin Asad is the uncle of Sayyidah Khadija, and he acts as her wali, her guardian. And the ceremony is arranged, so the uncles of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam go and they take the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam as well. And the nikah and the ceremony is going to take place in the house of Sayyidah Khadija radiallahu taala anha. So they get there. They get to the house. The nikah ceremony is set, and Abu Talib stands up. Abu Talib stands up to deliver a sermon to give a khutbah. He begins and the khutbah is recorded, but a summary of the khutbah is that Abu Talib starts by praising the Quraysh. And he praises the nobility of the Quraysh and he shows thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for granting this honor and this nobility to the Quraysh by making them the custodians of the Kaaba, etc, etc. Then he goes on to mention the praiseworthy and the beautiful attributes and characteristics of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his nephew. And he says that my nephew, there is nobody amongst the youth of the Quraysh that is like my nephew, in his moral character. There is nobody who is more trustworthy than him. There is nobody who is more reliable than him. There is nobody who is more truthful than him, sallallahu alayhi wa So he mentions these things in his khutbah, in his sermon, that he delivers in the nikah ceremony of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa Abu Talib then finishes his sermon, and uh, the uncle of Sayyidah Khadija stands up, and he says, Abu Talib, whatever you have said, it is as such. Whatever you have said, meaning whatever you have said, you have spoken the truth and we accept this proposal. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Sayyidah Khadija radiallahu anha are, in, uh, are married and the nikah ceremony takes place in the house of Sayyidah Khadija. Now, with regards to the mahr, it is mentioned in the khutbah of Abu Talib that Abu Talib said that I give you a meaning, I ask for your hand in exchange of 12 uqiyya and one nash. That was the mahr that Abu Talib paid on behalf of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to Sayyidah Khadijah al-Kubra radiyallahu ta'ala anha. Twelve uqiyya and one nash. And this is mentioned in a hadith in uh, Sunan ibn Majah where the Prophet alayhi wa sallam, uh, it is narrated from Abi Salama that he asked Sayyidah Aisha radiyallahu anha. And Abi Salama taqala, Sa'altu Aisha ta, kam kana sadaqu nisa'i nabiyy sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, qalat kana sadaquhu fi azwajihi ithnatay asharata Meaning what? Abu Salama, a Sahabi of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he asked Sayyidah Aisha radiallahu anha, and he asked, O oh Aisha, what was the dowry or what was the mahr payment for the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? To which Sayyidah Aisha radiallahu anha, she replied, that the mahr that the Prophet sallallahu gave to his wives was 12 uqiyya and one nash. Okay? And one nash is what? One nash is half of an uqiyya. And in total, 12 uqiyya and half a, uh, and one nash, which is half an uqiyya, that equals 500 dirhams. How does it equal 500 dirhams? One uqiyya is 40 dirhams. So one uqiyya is 40 dirhams. So times that by 12, you have 480. And then, one nash is 20 because it's half of an uqiyya and that completes the number 500 dirhams. So the dowry and the mahar that Abu Talib gave to Sayyidah Khadija on behalf of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was 12 uqiyya and one nash which is equivalent to uh, 500 dirhams. However, in another report we find that the dowry that uh, Abu Talib gave or that was given to Sayyidah Khadija was 20 camels. Now there's a Ikhtilaf in terms of the number or the amount of mahr that was given. However, some of the scholars reconciled this by saying that the mahr was in fact what is mentioned earlier, 12 uqiyya and one nash, uh, which equals to 500 dirhams. However, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa also increased 20 camels as well. Okay, But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. But this uh, narration in Ibn Majah explicitly mentions 12 uqiyya and one nash. Then there is a misconception or a false information rather that is spread that Sayyidina Ali radiallahu an was also part of the mahar that was given to Sayyidina Khadija uh, from, on behalf of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa That's incorrect and there is no basis to that. This is an uh, innovation or this is something that has been added later on by people or the people of Kufa. Uh, 
So that is regarding the marriage of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam with Sayyidah Khadijah al-Kubra. So a quick recap of that is when the Prophet sallallahu returns from his journey to Sham, Sayyidah Khadijah notices the impressive qualities that the Prophet sallallahu has within himself, and because of that, she wants to uh, inquire more about the Prophet. So she goes to Sayyidah Safiya bint Abdul Muttalib, the aunt of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and also the wife of Sayyidah Khadijah's brother Awam. She goes to her, she inquires more. And the answers she receives, she is satisfied with those answers. And she's overwhelmed actually. She's happy with those answers that she receives from Sayyidah Safiya. And thereafter, she sends her proposal to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam via a woman named Nafisa bint Munya. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam receives this proposal. He passes it on or he conveys the message to his uncles. And they all gather in the house of Sayyidah Khadija to commemorate uh, the ceremony of nikah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the wali at the time was the uncle of Sayyidah Khadija who is known as Amr bin Asad he acted as the wali because the father of Sayyidah Khadija Khuwailid had passed away and that is how the ceremony of the Prophet والسلام, his first marriage to Sayyidah Khadija took place in this manner Abu Talib delivered a khutbah and paid the dowry of 500 dirhams 12 uqiyah and one nash to Sayyidah Khadija on behalf of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we've covered the second journey to Sham and the marriage of Sayyidah Khadija to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We have a few more things uh, which are regarding the marriage, um, meaning the previous marriages of Sayyidah Khadija and then the age of Sayyidah Khadija at the time of marriage. There is a bit of a discussion regarding that. And then also the children of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam via Sayyidah Khadija. Inshallah, because this has become slightly long, we will discuss those, Inshallah, next week alongside the history of the Kaaba and the rebuilding of the Kaaba. Assalamu uh, Alaikum wa Rahmatullah. <laughs>